Hi, folks, and welcome to another session on high performance teams. Today, I'm delighted to welcome John Kavanagh, who has been the head of HR for the Kentech Group for 20 years, I think. Now, John, if I have that right. And a, and a few more, but there are thereabouts, yeah. Excellent. Well, John, welcome. And it's it's really fantastic to get to speak to you today. Thanks for taking the time to to, to join me this morning. John, I'd like to jump straight in and ask you just a little bit about yourself, kind of professionally in your career, and maybe maybe anything personal about you as well that you might like to share. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, so thanks, Sarah. Thanks for asking me on this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be getting into this type of conversation. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I go back a long way, so this might take a little bit of time. <laughs> It's good, but, good. Uh, I, I was I was born and raised in Thomastown in Kilkenny, uh, for my sins, and uh, you know I, I'm I'm the second eldest of six. Uh, my father was a local shopkeeper, and you know so we were kept busy for like we never had a day off, you know. So we were, my father always walked the shop seven days a week. The only days he was closed were Good Friday and Christmas Day. Other than that, wow. we were open for business, so wow. we were never left idle. So uh, yeah, I. Uh, I, I went to I went to secondary school in uh, Ross Gray in Tipperary boarding school. I remember at the time I, I I was I was I was smart enough at, at primary school for some reason or other, and I managed to get one of these county council scholarships. It oh, was worth good. fifty quid at the time, fifty quid a year. <laughs> but actually, that might sound not sound like a lot of money, but but it paid almost half the fees for for a year away in boarding school in those days. So anyway, that can give you an idea how far back this is, right? But anyway, um, I went to Ross Gray, and uh, I, I guess uh, uh, I loved boarding school. I loved because there was lots of sport and lots of camaraderie and stuff like that. I, you know, I, re I really liked it. But one of the things that I, I could get easily distracted, and uh, I suppose the closer as I got to, to leave and start, I was quite confused about what I wanted to do in life, you know. And um, I ended up, um, as I say, I, I, I did get distracted a lot in those days. And I wasn't a great fellow for getting out the books. Uh, right. And I had quite an average leaving cert. And uh, I remember talking to my father. My father had a, had a great influence on me. And uh, I was very in, much interested in stuff like music and art and stuff like that at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had no real role models in my life around that. So, you know, you're, you're all the time being sort of pushed down quite traditional professional routes, if you are thinking that direction. Um, but... Uh, my father came up with this idea, well, art, that's very close to being an architect. So why don't you become an architect? You know, so I, I sort of convinced myself, but I really didn't do well enough to follow that route. And uh, I ended up um, at the time, the, the, they start, the, the regional and technical colleges had opened up. So I ended up going on a construction studies course there. Something, I, you know, the way uh, sometimes especially in those days, you were a lot of pressure to make a decision in your life, even if, it, even if it was the wrong one. But anyway, off I went, and a couple of years later, I ended up working in construction. And uh, I worked for a company called Dublin Brothers. Great, great outfit, actually, from County Tipperary. I think they're still on the go. Uh, and I, I quite liked it, but uh, it, was, it wasn't really my cup of tea. And I remember uh, one winter up on a uh, we were building a factory up in Neen in Tipperary. I lost a pair of Wellington boots in the mud. And uh, as I traipsed back to the, to the site office, you know, in my jeans and socks and drenched in, yeah. I said, I have to get out of this. I have to do something else. So I joined a company in Dublin uh, called ICBS, uh, who were uh, doing a lot of contracting in Europe. And I ended up heading off to Holland and Germany for a couple of years. And... Uh, sort of as a, a junior manager, if you like, uh, organizing guys around construction sites in Holland and Germany, great education at the time, you know? And uh, I, I met my wife around the same time, uh, Marion, she's, she's, she's from Wexford. And uh, so I, I decided I wanted to, we wanted to get married, so I wanted to move back to Ireland. So they gave me a job in the, in the office in Dublin. And so I ended up doing a lot of recruitment for the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. And a uh, few years later, uh, I was tapped up by Kent's and Clonmel because they were doing a lot of stuff overseas and they were looking for people who understood the markets. 
So yeah. hence, this is my career in oil and gas globally commenced around 1984, I think it was. Uh, so over time, I, 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 I pretty much been with the Kent family since then. I think it was 14 years with MF Kent and, and 22 years with uh, Kentec. Wow. So from starting from a sort of a recruitment role, I, I migrated to HR and uh, I remember moving to the UK in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, it was a fantastic experience. I think that's where the real foundations of my HR career were, were sort of uh, were, were built. Uh, because the UK in those days were heavily unionized. And I found it was an area I loved working in. I loved the challenge of problem solving in, uh, you know, a sort of uh, potentially conflict uh, sort of areas. And, and you know, as I said, there was a very, very uh, heavy IR prof profile. And uh, there was some, some great projects that worked in, in, in those years, uh, yeah. which I think, as I said, I think took a lot on what, what I was able to bring forward later on. Yeah. Um, and from there, you know, literally, I, I then went overseas and went to Kuwait and uh, came back to Ireland for a short stint, actually. Left Kent, came back to Ireland for a short stint at the end of the, end of the 90s. And I spent a year in Bosch and Lom and Waterford, actually. They were right. building a new factory and I went in there as a sort of specialist recruiter, recruiter. They were recruiting a lot of specialist type engineers and so on. And eventually, that's when I joined Kentec uh, down in Little Island. And uh, Kentec were that time probably doing 70% of the work in Ireland. Uh, you might have heard of Dorn and Engineering. Yes. Dorn and no, Engineering Dorn. was then part of Kentec Group. Uh, they later, later split away around the mid, but at that time, probably 70% in Ireland. We had about 150 apprentices working for us that time. So again, that was, that was very, very interesting work. And uh, uh, the international side of the business started to really take off for Kentec. And uh, so Kentek were working in places like Russia and Kazakhstan, and suddenly the Middle East took off towards the mid to late noughties. And that's when Kentek relocated their head office from Little Island down to Dubai. And a lot of the management team went to the time, and so did I. So that's where I've been as HR director for the last sort of 12 years or so. And the wings of Kentek have spread wider and uh, further into places like Australia, North America, um, uh, and lots of lots of other places in between, yeah. um, and so, you know, it, it's been quite a journey, uh, uh, and particularly the last four or five years, we've gone through a fantastic change, and uh, we would reckon transformation, and it's it's a it's a different company than it was seven or eight or nine years ago, even, right? Yeah. And uh, they're actually in a great place at the moment. Um, Funnily enough, about a year ago, uh, I, uh, I over a year ago, actually, about October 19, uh, this was something that was looming for me for a while because not, not so much to do with my age. I just needed to, to spend a bit more time with the family and uh, do other things in my life. Um, but I, I agreed with the then CEO, Sarah Kent, that I would step aside uh, from the role, sort of mid-2000, or mid-2020, should I say, yeah? Yeah. Um, of course, little did I know I was coming around the corner uh, with COVID. And uh, so uh, it didn't quite play out as the way, the way, the way we, we originally planned. Uh, so literally at the end of October, I stepped aside from my role. Eventually, it was supposed to happen at the end of June, but it happened at the end of October yeah. as the HR director. And I, but I continue with Kentech as a, a consult, consultant uh, into the future. So I'm still on board with the team. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, I've stepped I've stepped aside. I'm I'm now sort of more of a bystander role, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. And right. as I, said, I want to open up a few other things in my life going forward. So that that sort of brings it up to date uh, from a career perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I sort of went I went back to, to college a couple of times in between. I sort of remember going to night school in the UK to get my proper HR credentials a year ago. And yeah. even was it three or four years ago, I did a strategic HR sort of thing up at the IMI in Dublin, um, Very good. which was really, really good at the time uh, in 2016. So I've always tried to keep myself fresh and keep my thinking fresh all the time. Yeah. Um, on, on, on a personal basis, I'm, I'm married to Marion for 40 years. We actually oh. celebrated our 40th anniversary in August on Zoom. Right? Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Congratulations. We still, have have, we still have to have the proper celebrate. Yeah, celebrate. that's that's some milestone but, though. Fair play. 
yeah, so we, we just need, I just need it. We just need a, I suppose, COVID situation to clear about when we go and celebrate yeah. properly. Yeah. Um, the original plan was to take a couple of months off when I finished, but that's all on hold as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I have a son and a daughter. They're both well into their 30s and two fantastic um, young people and uh, uh, Owen and Deemer and we have a couple of dogs. Yeah. Um, to keep myself uh, as a whole, let's say, right, and balanced, I, I, I try to look after myself, food, I, I go to the gym, uh, quite regularly, do a bit of yoga. Uh, I'm trying out meditation quite a lot these days. Oh, very good. It's been to work for me. Play the guitar, play the music, and you know, I like to do a bit of reading. So, uh, it, I think that's a really important part to keep you to keep sort of some sort of balance on your life because uh, it's uh, it's it, it's so easy to fall in, particularly when you're working away a lot. You can fall into a sort of a, a seven day working mode. And, yeah, uh, you don't enough to, to, to sort of. As uh, Stephen Covey used to say, to sharpen the saw. Uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, so that's that's about it. I don't know. Uh, uh, that's that. That's a great overview, John. That's a great overview. It's lovely to hear about your career and how it developed and kind of kind of how it took oh, you yeah. through. I, mean, yeah. I, I ended up. I I certainly ended up in HR uh, without great intentionality. It sort of I sort of migrated into it, you know. But it, it's great. I, I found it a fantastic career. Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, but uh, yeah, it wasn't you, down to any career planning. If you found your path, you found your way. Yeah. Trying different things, you find your way, which yeah. is, and you know what? And probably the best laid plans. I think so that that must be the case for so many people. I know it certainly resonates with me. You you try one thing, figure it's not for you. You try something else until you find you find your path and and where you want to go. Yeah, you, I, I guess that, I suppose it, it's it's uh, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, Dara. Uh, you know, look back to my generation, there wasn't a lot of choice, mm-hmm. you know, so and you felt a lot of pressure to take whatever was going. Uh, you know, there would appear to be a lot more choice nowadays, which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But in itself, it, it brings its own sort of uh, pressures because uh, and particularly what is driven, you know, a lot of the social media uh, youngsters nowadays are, are uh, they're looking at other people who apparently have perfect lives. Yeah. Uh, which is not actually the case, but that's the way they look at it. Yeah. Uh, so they're looking for that perfect decision, the perfect job, the perfect partner, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And it brings massive pressures. Yeah. But our experience was different. The pressures were, were just a bit different. We, we, we just didn't have the choice, so we just got on with it. Yeah. Um, so. You know, John, John is you're, 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 as you're talking about kind of your career there and, and your how you developed with, you know, first with, with Kent and Clamel and then with... Kentech and like the growth of Kentech. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a significant global organization now at this stage, um, and and with eyes on future significant growth as well. It it takes it must take really strong leadership uh, to be able to kind of drive a company for the, for that length of time and through all the different changes. And now you're looking at another transformation again. And I guess in your position as HR, you've probably seen so many different leaders within the organization as well. Yeah. C- can you tell me a little bit about I- I leadership and kind of what leadership means to you? Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, I suppose nowadays it's very clear to me. Uh, my own definition, I think it's, it's quite, I, I, I could articulate what leadership means to me right now, but it certainly was a journey, uh, not just for me, but watching what other people were doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what I accepted along the way, or what went for leadership uh, along the way, um, some of it wasn't great. And, uh, but it sort of got the job done, you know, there were different priorities. But today, yeah. uh, today for me, leadership, I think the foundation of leadership is, is, is about trust. Mm. You sort of you, you start and you end with trust. It's like, uh, you know, how do I put it? Um, if you know, uh, we, we tend to think about, uh, you know, particularly if you even look at the way we employ people. Typically, now companies are changing nowadays, but the typical employment sort of making are set up in the opposite direction of trust. You know, so it's sort of saying, uh, you know, so we sort of say things. Oh yeah. We, we give you that opportunity if, 
you prove yourself or we'll do this if. And so, you, you know, rather than the equation is you have to extend trust in the first place in order to build it. And yeah. it takes an awful lot of time, uh, particularly if you're trying to uh, transform the culture of an organization. It takes an awful lot of time to build that trust across the organization. And it only yeah. takes a second to dismantle it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's at the foundations of everything that you do. And yeah. in order to build that trust, you need to be open and sort of transparent. And it takes an awful lot of time, uh, you know, particularly if you're a company in transition, to get to a point where you are starting to become as open and transparent as people sort of uh, feel comfortable with. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, the, you know, I, anyway, that, that would be the very first thing I would talk about. The second one uh, I talk about uh, would be courage. And, you know, I, I think that looking back on my own career is that uh, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't always as courageous as I'd like to have been. And even that to this day, um, it doesn't always happen the way you want it to happen uh, when you measure yourself against courage. But what happens is, and I found out the hard way with this, is that you go through life and you're working in management teams and executive teams. Um, I found myself quite often uh, sitting at the wrong side of the debate and sort of getting quite frustrated with things, right? But I started to look at what was going on and I, I, I sort of discovered to my own frustration after a while that I was looking at things differently to maybe a lot of other people. Uh, and what I saw, and I saw that initially as a barrier, but actually it was an advantage, but I didn't know how to use it. And so over time I started, so you start, so what you do is, uh, you know, you're in discussions uh, with people and you feel strongly about something and you're outnumbered, uh, so you sit in your hands and you let the moment pass. But what I did over time, I learned to, be, to start challenging more and to become more courageous about the challenge and to stay in the to stay in debate a bit longer. And uh, it, it wasn't that I was always right, but your point of view is always uh, very important. Yeah. And so the, that's a that's around the courage thing, and it takes enough of the courage to keep going back, yeah. uh, and and also to know when to let go. Uh, yeah. You know, so. I, I think courage is really important, and uh, the, uh, the what do you call it? The um, to be able to uh, to be able to uh, show your own vulnerability as well. Not to be afraid to say you don't know. Not yeah. to be able to afraid to say, well, you know, um, I don't know about this. Yeah. I'm not the expert here, and uh, it, it, it's it's massive, and also. To show your own weaknesses uh, it's actually quite important at the end of the day because people get their own courage from that they get their own power from that and yeah. they see if somebody's prepared to that they think it then it's okay for them not to be perfect as well I, I yeah. think it's really really important um, um i mean i think that's um the other thing that again it's it's only it's coming out more and more in recent years it's about bringing your whole self to work yeah you know, uh you know most of my career you sort of almost compartmentalized uh you know your life between work and then you know your family life and maybe your social life um and over time that's sort of broken out but nowadays you know it, you spend so much time with your colleagues at work that actually quite often they become your best friends. And that's yeah. what's coming out more and more nowadays. For years ago, it was sort of segregated. You didn't consider people you worked with as your best friends necessarily and so on. Yeah. And you didn't really bring your family issues to work. Yeah. Uh, if you know what I mean. Or yeah. whatever. But nowadays, it's, it, it's, it's actually become an important part of, uh, you know, um, um, the sort of culture of an organization. In Kentic, we started something a few years ago called We Are Family, which is all about this. It's about, you know, it's all about talking about your family, whether, you know, so we love, we love people, say, from India and the Philippines working, and we love have them coming on Zoom calls, telling us about uh, their education plans for their kids uh, in university, whatever it might be, and stuff like that, which is fantastic. And yeah. uh, or sharing some of, the, some, of their, uh, some of their real issues, health issues, mental health issues, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, those conversations weren't possible five, ten years ago. 
but mm. uh, they're becoming more and more the norm. So it's it's really about bringing your whole self into the organization, not being afraid to open yourself up a little bit and get a not huge amount back for that because people then see that as something that's okay to do. Yeah, and they're quite happy, and they're more comfortable to follow or more likely to follow suit. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think they're the ones that pick out. I mean, yeah, there, there are lots more, but they'll be the ones that pick out. Yeah, that's uh, that's I, I love hearing about that courage piece, because as you say, if you are in a group of people and they're thinking of it one way and you have a different perspective, it can be real. Certainly, again, that yeah. really resonated with me. It can be difficult to stand up and say, well, hang on, guys, I'm looking at it yeah. differently. I think yeah. that's really was, interesting. Sorry, John. It was, it was, it was an aha for a moment for me. If, that's quite a few years ago. We did some psychometrics on the, on the team and, you know, uh, it's a psychometric profiling and uh, I remember what, because I, I saw the results for the whole team and I was yeah. stuck in one corner and everybody else was in the other. Not everybody else. It was almost like that, but I was, in, yeah. I was a polar opposite to everybody. And I freaked out because I, I thought, oh my God, I'm the problem here. <laughs> but, but actually, when I got in and I was working with the coach at the time, I started talking about it. Uh, he said, no, no, actually, he, he sort of turned it right on. He said, no, no, you are the actual, uh, you know, uh, he, he put it more strongly than I would put it, but he sort of said, you are actually a gem in here because uh, you, you represent the sort of diversity uh, the person who asked, you know, potentially could ask the question that needs to be asked. In yeah. other words, turn something on its head and look at it from a different angle and say, hey, have you, have you thought about this? So yeah. I, I started doing that then, and um, I had been doing it before that, but I wasn't confident about doing it. Now it became more confident about it because uh it was you know it, it was and sometimes yeah. people would appreciate you doing that yeah they often don't. and i've you know I've, I've had conversations with a number of different people talking about kind of leadership and high performance and that that diversity piece is is essential is essential for success you know it's I, one of the questions i wanted to ask you about leadership is around kind of nature versus nurture and like I'm hearing a lot about kind of learning and development from you as I'm talking to you now, but I'll, I'll still ask yeah. it anyway, where you feel this, the strongest balance is, is, is kind of leadership more of a natural thing or is it something you learn and develop over time? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. <laughs> I, I, it's definitely nurture for me. Mm -hmm. uh, largely, largely nurture. Yeah, uh, but, it's, it, but, it's, but it's, it's huge because a lot of our belief systems are built in so young, when we're so young, you know, when we're, when we're babies, when we're, when we're growing up, when we're yeah. with our families or going to school and so on. So there's so much of it already almost crystallized by the time you get to thinking about what real leadership, but it can be, it can be, uh, it can be remodeled. Uh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, you know, they talk about charisma and so on, and, and that's fantastic. I think charisma is a thing, by the way. I think yeah. there are people who are fantastic connectors. Yeah. And that will always be the case, but they're not always great human beings, right? right. We've, seen that. We've seen that. If you look at politicians, you can see that across the world, you know? Yeah. But charisma is a great thing to have if you've developed your leadership skills. Um, uh, but I, I absolutely think, uh, you know, uh, they talk about emotional intelligence. And the one thing to say about emotional intelligence versus IQ is that emotional intelligence can be developed. And, and, and emotional intelligence is, is really that whole spectrum around emotional intelligence is, is what leadership is about. Right. Uh, and they're all developable skills. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, it's like the, I don't know if you've ever read the, uh, the, the, the book, uh, I can't remember the name, but no, but the sporting book, about 10,000 hours. Oh, oh, Bounce. Is it Bounce by Matthew Syed? Uh, no, I, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway. Right. It, so it basically says, if you spend 10,000 hours at anything, you'll become as good as anybody in the world. Yeah. Uh, so some guy in, the, in America decided he wanted to become a professional golfer. So he's gone on this route of doing the 10,000 hours. Uh, right. But I think what the 10,000 hours is probably the average. <laughs> right, so if you're right. Tiger Woods, you might need 1,000 hours. If you're me, you might need 20,000 hours. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, this is the... the so, so but what it's really saying is you can, you can actually become skilled at anything if you spend long yeah. enough at it, you work hard enough at it. And it's about yeah. elbow grease rather than about intuition or intellect. 
yeah yeah that's 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 fa- and it's, it's, it's the, the more the more i read about those ten thousand hours and purposeful practice i think is what yeah. they were calling it but uh that's right that's right yeah. fascinating fascinating stuff um in, in terms of, of leadership from in your experience has it been more kind of planning or is it kind of intuition where where have you felt it fall um planning or intuition um yeah i i i, I see the planning is more of a sort of a management uh, function uh and intuition is definitely okay at the end of the day i think your intuition only works if with experience right right and i think the leadership is the learning so so you hone your leadership skills around that then you've got a formula so if you can bring the planning together and intuition based on experience and then you build leadership real leadership uh, skills around that yeah. uh, you've got you've got a sort of you're getting closer to to the, to to the, the overall picture that's required yeah uh, i mean it, it, well this is my experience as well because i think a lot of my education about leadership has only probably come in in the last 10 15 years so wow. really getting into looking at what leadership is all about yeah, I spent most of my life sort of trying to figure it out by intuition. Right. Okay. But what I found is that when you start doing the the the, the upskilling and and getting yourself up to speed with le- real leadership skills, you found that your experience is really valuable. Yeah. And that your intuitions then start to work much better. Yeah. Like, um, uh, generally, you, you're now getting structure around what you already know. Yeah. You yeah, how to use it before. Yeah. Now the leadership skills shows you how to put your experience into effect. Yeah. That's where it pays off. Yeah, that so makes you, sense. You could spend you could spend twenty years, say, working um, in a career. Say, you know, say for instance, you go into a trade and then you become, say, a supervisor and then you become a manager. Uh, you'll pick up fantastic experience, but you run eventually run down a rabbit hole. You run out of you run out of gas uh, unless you develop your leadership skills. You keep yourself right. fresh and you're thinking fresh and then yeah. you can really leverage your experience um, right so all the intuition and so on starts to really work well because you know how to use it you can put language around it and you can actually adapt it to different you're, situations you're developing it you're developing yeah. it over time yeah. and i guess the, the planning piece sounds like it's in the kind of learning and development itself yeah yeah i, I think there's I, I see planning is, is absolutely essential. Uh, good planning is essential to any business, but it, it's, it's a fundamental skill. Do you know what I mean? And some people are, again, some people are better planners than others. Yeah. I was never a great planner. I could do the overall stuff, but in terms of sitting down and, and, and sort of doing an A to Z on something, yeah. uh, I'd sort of start losing interest when I got to about, uh, you know, L or M. <laughs> right yeah yeah you know i wanted to move on to the next project but but yeah. other people are really meticulous and really good at it um yeah yeah uh, but i see planning as a very much a, a functional skill yeah uh, based on knowledge of whatever you're doing yeah yeah that makes sense john can i can i ask you looking at the teams themselves what have you know when you what do you look for in a high performance team or what do you see are the kind of key characteristics we've probably touched on a couple of them already now so we might be yeah, yeah. Yeah. might be going over some, yeah. uh, some ground we covered but so for those high performance teams what do you think are those key characteristics yeah uh, uh, let me let me tell you maybe uh, a little bit about the story in Cantec might help because uh, you know, if we go back about it's about seven or eight years ago, and again, it's about what we might have thought of as high performance uh, versus how we learned in between. And I think we, we would look at it differently now. But funnily enough, we started out something. This is back in around 2013, where we were having performance issues on, on some of the projects, and uh, you know, it was really causing us a bit of a problem because we were sort of stuck a bit at the time in terms of. Uh, company's growth and performance levels and projects and stuff like that. 
So, um, and it was all about performance. That was really what we wanted to get to. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we sat down and we, we talked about, uh, well, let's, let's, uh, let's get all the guys uh, really tuned up on the, on the company procedures and so on, because they're not using them and we need, really need them to be efficient. So we need, and they don't yeah. even know how to use them and they don't know where they are. And it was all this sort of stuff. So it was all, uh, became a sort of a training course for all our field supervisors, let's say, right? right. The manager. So we were to come up with this, but we, we started looking at it. Anyway, long story short, we came up with something. Hey, listen, this is different. This, is, this, this isn't about the guys in the field uh, that don't know how to find the procedures or whatever. This is goes right to the sort of into, into the boardroom. It's about leadership and behaviors across the organization because, you know, uh, and it was a fully connected sort of first time but I saw it in Kenya, fully connected thinking about how to change the company. And we came up with this idea about transformation. And, right. uh, we, uh, we called it K2, which was sort of, it was, we, we felt that we needed to give it a name to for yeah. people, to, and we sort of explained the reason it's K2, K for Kentech, and it was K to the power of two, and K2, the, uh, the second highest mountain, and probably the most difficult to climb in the world, and so on. So we created a picture around this, but more importantly, we sort of said what it was about, and it was about value, and it was about ambition, and about different things. So it caused us to really go back and look at everything we were doing, and we, we overhauled... Um, you know, our mission, vision, uh, uh, ambition, all that stuff uh, that was hidden in the drawer somewhere and they needed dusting off. That all yeah. got refreshed and we, we actually reinvented the whole thing. And I remember at the time, because you know how businesses are, well, when is this going to be done? That was the question that was asked. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, remember we came up with, we came up with a five stage, five, we call it a five phase strategy and we said it would be done in 18 months, but it's actually still going on, right? But right. it, it actually got traction and uh, the transformation uh, continues, if you know what I mean. But yeah, but I would say it so I kicked off in 14. And we, we had a couple of really uh, not great years, but actually the performance, you could see the lag, but it, it actually started to kick in around 17, 18. The performance sort of took off and it enabled us then to affect a huge amount of additional change. Like it changed the whole organizational structure in 18, 19, and then even coming into 20. What it yeah. meant is coming into the COVID year from a, from a, a terms of uh, the dynamics in the organization, from that yeah. performance, high performance perspective, it totally changed. Yeah. It took a while. And when we came into COVID, it actually accelerated. You know, wow. So even though we had to make changes and we had to make some, uh, some brutal changes, and we lost some really good people because I think most organizations in the world were affected similarly. Yeah. Um, uh, but the, the fact is that we, and, and it's, it's, I was on a call this morning with the guys and the, the performance this year has been really fantastic. Now, obviously yeah. we had to redraw uh, the numbers uh, around the, around April based on what the new year was going to look like, but yeah. we've actually, they've been knocked out of the park, those numbers this year. Yeah. And uh, what you found is that you had uh, empowered teams that were able to, able to manage the crisis without the directors of the company necessarily jumping into every little decision right. uh, you know and these people are working across the globe quite often remotely yeah. and into some very challenging areas you know like um like uh, remote areas of kazakhstan and remote areas of russia and the middle east and so on and managing teams and, and managing all the logistics around those and managing crisis uh, yeah. for months and months on end yeah and uh it, it was a super performance and i let's put it this way if we went into it even a year, year and a half ago in the position we were then, uh, it would have been a different story, I think, you know? Wow. Um, so, you know, so, you know, it, it was, you might say it was, it was a good timing, but definitely, and, and not only that, we are coming out the end of this year and hopefully next year will, will be better and it's looking really good. Yeah. You're really uh, leading the race at this stage in terms of your competitors if you can do that. Yeah. And, and uh, was it, was this... Right? Was this kind of giving um, more kind of ownership and responsibility and autonomy out to these kind of regional teams? 
yeah 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 and and so, you know as i said we came up with this thing called our charter and that was that was an out an out one of the first outputs of k2 but it was all about values on top of that list was trust right and empowerment things like that empowerment and it's all about engagement so we, we've done a, a huge uh, a huge work on on communications and engagement over the yeah. last two two and a half years we yeah. really have leaned into that and we have to sort of uh, we have to update all our technology platforms in order to enable that in particular and again that that paid off hugely when we ended up uh, moving into this year uh, yeah. because of all the obvious uh, stuff that came out of it, like the remote working and so on. It's, it's been superb, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we wouldn't be ready for that a couple of years ago. Uh, but that, it's stuff we, we had already recognized we needed to do. Yeah. Uh, so, so that, that, so, yeah. So the, the company's become value driven and, you know, things like the, the We Are Family sort of uh, initiative came out of that as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you, you got a huge amount of that stuff going on and uh, it changed the landscape in terms of performance and kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And I love that. I, I love that. Uh, I love that symbolism of, of K2 as well. And the kind of a sense of a higher purpose, if you like, yeah. almost. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, that probably leads me nicely into kind of my 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 next question is around, you know, the remote work era, <clears throat> and yeah. has that had has that had a big impact on on Kentech, or have you seen the the kind of fundamentals of leadership and high performance change in this kind of in this kind of new era of remote work? Um. Uh, absolutely, yeah. But but like I was saying, I, I think what what happened is that you you saw uh, leaders emerge in this in this period of remote working that were invisible before. Now oh, whether that's yeah. some of that's down to the technology as well, who knows? But yeah. you know, so everybody obviously there was a huge dependency on the, on technology. We were ready for it. We wouldn't yeah. have been a year ago. Uh, we, we've done an awful lot of work on our IT. We, we appointed a new IT director when we was it again now nineteen was it? And we've actually transformed our whole technology uh, sort of uh, environment in Canada. Right. And uh, so we, we were we were actually almost ready for it anyway. We had to do yeah. very little to, yeah. to you know when COVID kicked in to actually uh, move forward. So we we ended up having fantastic communication channels already open. Right, um, and you know we were we were, we did we did town halls and then the height of the crisis we did town halls on on team Zoom and team well we did it on Zoom because Teams were, was impossible at the time uh, or no we did it on Teams actually there was a town hall functionality in Teams I think um, and uh, we we had we had hundreds of people on those calls from all yeah. over the world and that was just in the middle of the crisis a weekly sort of a call. Yeah, uh, potentially we were trying to bring, bring in as many as possible, but you know, we had about three and a half thousand employees. But it was it was always going to be a challenge to get them all on. But we were getting five, yeah. six, seven hundred at, at, at one stage, and yeah. uh, kept those going uh, throughout. And that wasn't something that we would have we wouldn't have entered our minds twelve months ago that we'd wow. be doing the town halls. And, yeah, and that was just just that's just one example. Um, but funny, I was I was. Uh, on a, on a call this morning, and uh, uh, with the uh, with the uh, it's a Dubai team, so it's sort of a, a couple of weeks, we a couple of days a week, we check in for a half an hour. Everybody gets on the call, and we sort of. So uh, this morning was a bit of a reflections for 2020, and yeah. one of the one of the, actually one of my team uh, who had been on maternity leave for most of the year, uh, she was actually she actually went on maternity leave the end of this time last year, end of December. And she didn't come back until first of October, and she was saying, on reflection, she, she couldn't believe uh, the uh, the uh, progress that we had made in the in the interim period in terms of technology, in terms of the technology oh. platforms we were using. And what she also said is that the whole Kentech Globe team is really much better connected than it would have been before. Something I hadn't noticed. But she yeah. said that this morning. You know? Oh, was it was that primarily down to Teams and Zoom, or were, were there? Yeah, a com combination of that. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so so we, we had made some organisational changes as well around, say for example, around uh, so say the functional teams like HR yeah. or say like finance. 
up to the end of 19, uh, they all reported to a regional structure. Yeah. Right. So there were, so the local regional manager or the local project manager was sort of he was he he was, that that person uh, sort of had all the function of the local finance, local HR, and so on reporting in. But we had decided to change coming into the year so that the functions would report into the function. So, for example, every uh, senior HR person across the world, irrespective of where they would report up into my team directly, right? But not into me, and. So we had to change. We had to we appointed business partners. So it actually changed the structure, and that was actually proved to be a winner as well. Wow! Because what you had then is you had the key players in the regions linked up with these HR business partners, along with the finance business partners, along with the HSE business partners, the quality business partner, and so on. So you had these sort of um, what, do they, what do they call it uh, uh, almost virtual teams, yeah, uh, working across the globe. Uh, cross-functional personal team working across the globe on the crisis issues yeah. and managing all that as as that would have been so difficult to do uh, a year ago. Do you know what I mean? Under the right. old structure, right? And uh, so these are all the enhancements of what we you know um, we have this. Uh, it's part of the organizational structure changes rolled out initially in eighteen, and yeah. they've been we've been continuing with them since. And that was all coming out of the, the K2 uh, drive, if you know what I mean, and the involvement yeah. of the company into a, a sort of being able to scale uh, globally uh, from where we were to, we had this ambition of half a billion uh, by 2021. Now, obviously, that's got a bit of a, a kick in the, in the teeth with COVID, and then yeah. a billion by 2025. But I think oh. the billion by 2025 is still achievable. That's 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 great to hear that. It's great to hear that ambition. It's really interesting as well when you're talking about how you changed the structure of the organization so it fit better as, as a as a global, you know, yeah. you're you're all over the world, you know, yeah. and having been able to kind of delegate kind of responsibility and autonomy out to the various different teams. Mm-hmm. And the benefits that you're you're starting to see from that, and the and the leadership, the kind of leadership yeah. rising rising to the rising to yeah. the rising to the top. That's not a great expression, but but the leadership coming out We're very showing clearly. Up like, yeah, showing up. You, you, we couldn't see them before as easily. You could see them plainly. You could see who the, the emerging. You could see the you know the people yeah. who were actually really knocking it out of the park. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, wow. Well, and, and, and in terms of the technology itself, was was the kind of technology? Did that come as okay? Look, we've we've restructured the teams. We're going to be more autonomous. We're going to have kind of um, various different teams managing themselves remotely. We need we need the IT infrastructure. We need that communication ability to be able to manage that. Was did that kind of come after or? or yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if we we joined it up that well. Uh, right. Okay. Thinking, but but I think it was always evident. I remember uh, uh, two years ago, just over two years ago, uh, it was early early eighteen, and I remember uh, having this debate with uh, Sarah Kent at the time. Sarah was the CEO at that time, yeah. and um, we really need to, you know, get uh, uh, communication. And engagement sort of thing sorted out. We need uh, so real time stuff because before that we were, you know, you were sending out emails and hoping that regional managers would then cascade the message and you know, or you might have, you know, we, we didn't really uh, we were using video calls a bit, but the tech. Sometimes we were working in areas where the te- the, the, the local IT infrastructure was quite poor anywhere in some yeah. parts of the world. So we yeah. were always struggling on that front to do communication. Yeah. So I remember. Saying to Sarah, uh, we need to have something that's right, you know, in the moment, so we can just immediately reach people. And yeah. anyway, so we, I started looking at different platforms, and yeah. uh, I'm a, I'm a, well, I'm accused of being a bit of a technophobe. Right. I don't quite buy that because <laughs> I actually, okay, I mightn't understand it, but I know what it does, right? Yeah. And I yeah. understand it better. So it's like. It's like, uh, you know, I fancy driving a Ferrari, but I'm not really interested in what's under the bonnet. I just want yeah. to drive it. And, you know, <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so, I, I, so I could describe what I wanted, but I didn't, I didn't know how to maybe articulate it. Let's yeah. put it that way. Too. 
And I contacted uh, uh, an old friend of mine who used to work in, in the team, uh, Mandy Kennedy. And Mandy, Mandy was, uh, was back at home working in Aberdeen. She had worked in, the, in my team for about four or five years. Yeah. But, but had left. And, but she was into, so she, she was a bit techie. Um, she, she was a HR sort of, uh, she was trained HR, so she, she understood. I said, Mandy, I need you to look, start looking at something. And we sort of kicked off a conversation, but it never really got going. Yeah. And it flipped over and back, went on for a while and sort of fizzled out. And then, um, uh, that's right, one of the other team went on maternity leave and I, I, I contacted Mandy and said, Mandy, you might, do, you want to, do you want to do some maternity cover uh, back in Dubai for a while? And she was up for it. So she came back in. That was about the middle of the year. And I was home, I think it was around August, and I got an email from uh, John Goulding. Um, uh, he was talking about something about work fever, and he started to describe it. I said, John, that sounds like what I was trying to describe to Mandy. Well, I didn't say that to him, but I said it to myself. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, then, I then brought that back to the table in contact, and I said, guys, I think this is worth looking at. Yeah. And yeah. so we, we eventually ended up um, going live with work fever towards the end of 18 yeah. and it's been a resounding success yeah and it gave us everything we wanted and probably yeah. more thought we get out of it and yeah. stay it's it's, a, it's been a super success yeah and it, it, it actually took us from zero to, to let's say 70 miles an hour in yeah. three months you know yeah. in terms of communication and, we, and, and i think without that we would have found it very difficult to move into this sort of teams environment or, or, or Zoom with town halls. And so people were already used to seeing stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, live and in the moment. And, and we, we, we also rolled it out with, with a, we, we didn't put any governance on it. So he said, once you're a Kentucky employee, you'll be on there. And we didn't, we, we didn't police it in any way or yeah. try to control. And we've never had a problem, never had an issue with it. Yeah. So, that's... so that, was, that was a massive move forward. Massive move. Yeah. It's, in, it's incredible, like talking about teams and talking about zoom and and of course work vivo which is is is, is as you've described it there transformational in terms of yeah. of employee engagement for companies it's a great bit of software yeah. it's it's incredible how technology the right technology can have such a dramatic impact. Like you have to have the planning in place and it sounds like yeah. you, Kentech had the structure there, but you needed kind of a means to, to, to communicate more effectively. And, and you did that. Yeah, it, the timing it, was perfect as well. Absolutely yeah. perfect. It was exactly what we were looking for at that exact point in time. Yeah, <laughs> excellent, excellent, John. This has been. Uh, I, I know I've kept you longer than I than I that a little bit longer than I than I promised, but this has been oh. a really really interesting conversation. Loved hearing about your career, the development of Kentech, and kind of how how you've been managing over the last few months. Um, just like, like I said, just to sign off, I would just like to say, really really appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with me today. It's been I've really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it's been super. I was just looking at the clock and I didn't realize I thought it was only about a half an hour gone. But <laughs> I, ten, I tend to ramble on, but it was really enjoyable. <laughs> Thanks very much for asking me on, 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 the, on the channel, yeah.